Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, hope you enjoyed your lunch and, and you're not too tired yet. Um, my name is Udo Steinecke. I'm working for Cable and Wireless um, within the engineering group, both in the public AS1273 part as well as in the so-called private AS4445 network, which is the M MPLS call, um, VPN net network. So let's start. Um, this talk is about how to connect one service provider's MPLS network within, uh, together with another service provider's network. Um, these networks uh, sh um, are designed to, to um, be interconnected according to the RSC 2547 BIS, which is layer three VPNs. No public in in internet stuff and yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, this presentation is divided into uh, two major parts, a, a general section which is just a r short review, how, um, no, what the methods are in a, from a technical perspective according to the RFC 2547. And the second part is just how CW has, has done that with other service providers. And a short report what uh, problems we had once we have done that the first time. And um, the, consider the considerations we have found that are necessary to think of once um, ISPs think of doing the interconnections. And a very, very short look into the future on what is going on in the IETF meetings. And, but this is just then a short uh, um, report on what I personally found very interesting. So let's start with the first part, the general section, what the different methods of interconnections. Okay, this is the agenda once again. Sorry. Yeah, I've talked so. Okay, <clears throat> the first method is um, two ISPs connect their networks with um, neighboring PE routers, and <clears throat> they are connected via yeah, lease lines, POSs, Ethernets, ATM, whatsoever, probably POSs. <laughs> and the first possibility is to, to use an, an back-to-back -back VRF on the connected in interfaces, which leads to every um, VPN that needs to be extended to the neighboring a AS will be configured as a sub-interface -in of the two PEs and each sub-interface will reside then in a uh, certain VRF which is then customer one, customer two, customer three, customer four, and, and so on. Um, do I miss something? Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, this possibility is pretty much known and everyone interested has read that stuff so far. The <clears throat> disadvantages is, um, that from an operational point of view, the configs, the configs tend, to, tend to grow very large and the troubleshooting section is pretty annoying then for the operational folks, so we didn't decide to, to do that one. Um, the <clears throat> bad coloring. Yeah, the second method is a little different. Um, again, we have the, the two neighboring PE routers um, and they do not exchange the, the, the labeled BGP prefixes from the, from the certain VRFs, uh, no, from, from the different VRFs, but 
they exchange only the slash 32 loopback IPs from all the IP, um, from all the PEs of the neighboring ISPs. Um, and the PE routers where the customers are connected on both ends just do multi-hop multi -hop eBGP sessions. Um, yeah, so far, so good. Um, yeah, I got the point with the multi-hop eBGP sessions. And the, th the third possibility is that, again, the, the two PE devices <clears throat> now um, exchange the labeled um, IPVPN v4 prefixes of the certain v VFS based on route targets and the route and the matching route distinguishers. So. <clears throat> Compared to the possibility before, we don't exchange the loopbacks of all the PE, of all the customer connected PEs, but we only um, exchange these label prefixes that are really um, um, that only are needed to um, bit between the two service providers. Um, based on the route targets, it is possible to uh, filter based on the route targets and route distinguishers and so on. But we come to that point a little bit later. I think, yeah, these were the, the three possibilities. I think this is clear so far. Any questions here? No? Okay. Okay, now the point, what we have chosen and, and why. <clears throat> Just to make sure, once again, CW operates two different networks. The one is AS1273, the public IP network, which is, you know, internet. <laughs> and, and on that net network, we don't operate MPLS VPNs. Um, for MPLS VPNs, layer three VPNs, we have uh, built and op 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 operate um, a different network, which is AS, which is run under AS 554, um, which is entire at the very moment running only layer three VPNs according to RSC 24, 2547. <laughs> um, and the interconnection method we have chosen with other service providers was the. Uh, Third option, just just to make sure which one that that was, the two neighboring PEs exchange the labeled IP IPv4 VPN prefix, pre, prefixes based on route targets and route distinguishers. Oops, I had more. Yeah, this is not the current slide. I, <laughs> the more descriptions here was the stuff from before. Oops. I think we have to change the, this is not the latest one. But there's no, no, no problem there. Um. Okay. Just one second. Does, does it bring anything? Okay, just one second. Okay, here we go. Okay, sorry for the short break. Yeah, so the last point um, was 
what method we have chosen. Again, this is the third method, exchanging the labeled v, uh, IPVPN v4 prefixes based on the route targets and route distinguishers. So our network looks like this. We have four regions which are confederated under 1AS triple four five, And we have a UK region which is, uh, which is using a private AS, a US and European and an Asian Pacific region. The regions are either directly connected or uh, other regions are transit regions, like for, Jap for the uh, Asian Pacific region, there's the main, main route going through the U US region, and there's a backup route through the UK region. Okay. So, <clears throat> once we first um, have um, decided to, to do interconnections with other carriers, carriers that, are, that have a greater, um, carriers that have more locations in, in areas where we don't have um, pops or so, um, we thought it is needed to, to connect with them. And, and once we went into the test stage in the labs, we found different points bits and pieces the, uh, <clears throat> that are critical or at least good, uh, good to think of. And we found that <clears throat> one of those, um, and I'm going through all, all these points, and the first one are the route distinguisher distinguish values. <laughs> OK, here we go. Um, the route distinguisher is an eight byte <clears throat> field that is prepended to every uh, IP prefix. The IP prefix then and the route distinguisher together make the unique IPV, IPVPN before <laughs> prefix. So um, within our AS, we, we, we take the form uh, 4445, which is the AS number, and then unique decimal numbers like from one to somewhere else. Um, one important point here is once the first interconnection has been done, we, we uh, run into the trouble that the RD values didn't match. So the, the neighboring service provider had different values than, than we had. and. We ran into mem um, <clears throat> we ran into um, routing problems, which were memory usage. The consumption was pretty high, and and <clears throat> and we had at least duplicate uh, prefixes going going around the both networks, and we tried to overcome that. Yeah, this is actually at this slide. <clears throat> Um, yeah. <laughs> Once we have different different route distinguishers uh, uh, that are exported from uh, both ends or from both ISPs, they are valid in both clouds. But the implications are that that every <clears throat> prefix is at, at least uh, at, uh, two two times. Two, di two times there, one with uh, service provider one's RD and one with the service provider two's RD, and, and they don't match, and very funny pr um, problems arise then. So it is very crucial that the service providers ag agree on the same route distinguishers for one certain v um, VPN or customer or VF, as you want to uh, call it. Um, yeah, <laughs> they should be the same on both ends. OK. Yeah, as I, as I told before, they should be the same. Um, 
Yeah, one operational issue is here. There are some um, tools around that can be either bought or self-written from <clears throat> or freeware. Some uh, provisioning tools use hard-coded um, routes to engage, just like like you add a new customer to the system, so uh, they increase the last de um, route distinguisher by one, and 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 this makes the um, automatic um, provisioning of a, of a new cust customer to the VPN network a little bit hard. So manual in intervention is probably not. Um, um, What's, what's the right word? Yeah, you, you cannot avoid manual intervention there. Okay. <clears throat> Bas basically, the, the same ac applies for the route targets. The route targets is an extended BGP com community that is uh, used within the address families IP, IPv4, no, IPvpn v4. <laughs> Family, and and it is <clears throat> used to determine whether a prefix is accepted by another PE or not. So, filtering, yeah, yeah. An interesting point of route <clears throat> targets is here. I've had the slide before, which was this one. Yeah. We do filtering of um, of traffic from uh, from one area to an to another based on the route targets. That that means once we have um, customers that are only there in the U U.S. region, we don't propagate the the VPN routes to the other region unless the customer hasn't got a site uh, unless the customer has a site there. So we need to to leak them. In that case, between the uh, regions, but otherwise we do not exp export the uh, routes to the other regions just to save memory and and yeah stuff like that. So back to the route targets. The numbering scheme is again the same. We use um, on the left hand side four 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 five, and then again we again decimal numbers. So, um, again, the route targets should be um, should be negotiated between the two service providers because this this makes the filtering of un unwanted prefixes easier. And one could say that. <clears throat> That why why not rewriting the the targets on on the two neighboring border router PEs where where the where the two service providers meet? Yeah, bas basically it would be possible, um, but um, we we didn't do that <clears throat> for sev for sev several reasons. One was. Um, one was that it is possible to uh, rewrite the, uh, the route target, but um, rewriting the distinguisher wasn't possible. And the manipulation is only um, doable on the import side, not on the export side. So uh, uh, again, the last point here is um, once you connect with another service provider, um, Make sure that that both ends try to have uh, no. Make sure both service providers use the same route target for each VPN they want to ex exchange. Okay. Yeah, this is <clears throat> this is just a short description why we have done that and what the implications are. I have to admit this slide. Uh, wasn't by me, so I had a hard time to to get around it. <laughs> and yeah, to explain that is a little bit odd for me right now, so I can't say too much here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Is, is, there, is this so, so far clear? Yes, no? Hope so. Okay. <clears throat> An important point to think of is also um, that each service provider has a different quality of service model, having different um, service classes. One has three bronze, silver, gold, while well, others have four or, or five. And one point is here that um, there's a need to, to, to do a mapping of one model from service provider A to the model of service pro provider B, unless the customers would be treated unfair in a in the way that that the that the maybe better maybe better cross model or service class silver from service provider A is in service pro provider B something a little bit worse, but also called called silver. So there's a need to to to, uh, to map these service classes, and this, <clears throat> and there are only two points where where this is uh, important. On the ingress PE, where the customer um, traffic gets uh, labeled and queued, and also on the e egress PE between the two service providers, and. Yeah, yeah. This is the interest. So here's here's a little example how this uh, mapping could could be done. Um, the implication of of that is <clears throat> that the PE router must support um, the other service providers cross model. Yeah, as, as I told you before. And yes, yeah. I think I've told that before. Here's just the slide that describes it a little bit better. Okay. Um, I've told that, I've told that. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, this slide is just what I've told you before. I just um, <laughs> changed the slides, not in time. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's an example how this could how this could work with the um, the <clears throat> customers label. Um, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. A little bit nervous. Um, we need to ensure that service providers one gold and silver and so on. Service classes are mapped with 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 our classes that can be named different, and <clears throat> we want to avoid unfair treatment of the customers either on our side or on the on the other side, and and so we do the mapping of of the exp bits, which are then the the, the DSCP values so far. Mm. The, manup the manipulation, as, as I said before, can all only be done on the ingress side, which is either the customer side, where the, cust the PE where the customer is connected, or the PE where the two service providers have their connections. And <clears throat> both service providers are responsible to, to um, know the other service providers values or classes and to map them accordingly. The, the mapping, unfortunately, is done uh, totally on a man manual basis w with the hope that the other service provider doesn't change their, their cross model without telling all, all the neighboring ISPs. So, okay. Another point is resilience. Like, like in the public IP network, we want to avoid just having one link with a neighboring ISP, so 
having multiple peering sites or interconnection sites and having multiple multiple points where where we connect with other service providers bless you <laughs> um, we have the we have the same issues like Randy had in his presentation before with suboptimal routing or asymmetric routing or, or stuff like that. <clears throat> um, just as a side note, this asymmetric or suboptimal routing can uh, can lead to to um, influence the the. Uh, the uh, the service level ag agreements and it is easy to 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 break the <laughs> to break the the values that that we have promised our cust customers so we try to uh, to avoid either asymmetric routing or sub -op -op optimal routing and there are ways to 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 do that and we all all know it from Phil Smith's uh, BGP introduction yesterday using meds use, using local prefs and stuff like that um, <clears throat> yeah meds local prefs or even com uh, the standard communities given that both ISPs a don't filter um, standard communities and B um, accept them and and transport them through uh, their own network so far okay security security is <clears throat> even there an, an, an issue one one would say that MPLS net uh, MPLS based VPNs um, once they are built on a in a se separate network are not faced to threats from the in internet because they are not reach reachable from the out outside world but there are still some issues we have the 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 two points between the PEs between the service providers and and even the CE routers, <coughs> CE to PE connection. So we want to avoid. Okay. 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 So I have to hurry up a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <coughs> So these are the, the the major two points where we want to <clears throat> make sure that uh, the devices cannot be taken over by someone else, or when the customer even has a breakout through the VPN to the connected. Um, no, <laughs> sorry. We have an we offer an internet breakout through the VPN to the global 1273 network, and we want to ensure that. All the internet breakout traffic is going through firewalls, and no one sees the the CE to PE links from the outside world. And we do want to avoid that no one sees the PE to PE links outside the world. So there are different meth, meth, methods. <clears throat> On the CEs, we could use standard ACLs, and I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so these are the major two points we have identified as, secu uh, as security concern points. Okay, um, stuff that we consider to, to um, test or implement soon. We want to support carrier supporting carrier stuff. This is currently in a test stage right now. Um, we want to we want to um, yeah, use a little bit of the OAM stuff, which is cu currently going on within the IETF, and we're looking forward to see something from the vendors. And draft Martini layer 2 VPNs, which we do not have right now, but uh, this, this is something that is being implemented. 
I would say, in September this year. And the, and the last side, the future stuff, which I, I think is, is pretty uh, interesting from the I, IETF side, is inside the working group PWE3. Um, this is the pseudo-wire edge-to-edge <coughs> -edge, I mean, emulation, which, is, which covers currently point-to-point -point links, and then the VCCB stuff, which also covers point-to-multipoint links. Okay, this is from the ITF side, yeah, what, what I think was the interesting part, most interesting part. So if there are any questions, either <coughs> um, write, write, write a mail so I have time to think about it, or even outside because we are really short on, on time, get, get me a beer later and ask, ask there. Thank you. Are there any questions?